Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this uh, chat discussion about Julian Assange. My name is Deepa Driver. I'm a trade unionist and academic based in London. And um, we're here with probably the, the nicest panel, as far as I'm concerned, uh, of people to talk about Julian, both from a personal perspective of knowing him really well, but also from an understanding of the kind of issues that are really important in the case of Assange. For those of you who've, who've um, not really engaged with the case before, WikiLeaks was really important in terms of revolutionizing journalism because before we had WikiLeaks, we had the print media, which was constrained in terms of the acceptable range of discourse because we had the Maxwells of this world deciding what you and I could read or understand. And then we had these improvements in technology and WikiLeaks came along and revolutionized journalism because it married technology with journalism and allowed those who really know what's going on behind closed doors to talk to ordinary people without having this layer of intermediaries and journalists, so to speak, to decide what the public should or should not see. Many of you will have watched the various sessions over the last couple of days, and many of you will be uh, deeply knowledgeable and deeply uncomfortable with what was done to Jeremy Corbyn and the way in which the media was complicit in the framing of Jeremy. And WikiLeaks was part of the revolution ever so long ago about of changing how ordinary people understand what's going on in the world. So typically, if you have a relative in a care home or a, or a sibling in prison, or if you know somebody who's in Yemen or in a, in a war-torn state, you want to know what's, what's really happening. But much of what you understand is often through only if somebody on the inside speaks up. And WikiLeaks allowed these insiders, people like Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, to tell us what was going on. And most of us know WikiLeaks because of the reporting on war crimes. But WikiLeaks was also important in letting us understand corruption in Kenya, toxic waste dumping off the Ivory Coast, um, the Arab Spring in Tunisia, so many things were prompted by WikiLeaks's revelations in terms of the kinds of changes we made as a society to make the world a better place, which I think are not on the left and in this particular uh, conversation are really interested in. And besides being revolutionary and marrying large amounts of data with traditional journalism, WikiLeaks also allowed for the fact that the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardians, and the other big newspapers have, an, have the attention span of an act. They want to look at something for a little while. They want to look at big headlines. And after that, they forget about some of the key issues. And it is local newspapers and local journalists who understand the real detail and are able to parse through the truth. And that's what WikiLeaks did. It engaged with both big organizations like The Guardian and The Washington Post and Le Monde and others, but also small organizations like Stefania Maurizi's uh, Repubblica and others in Italy and organizations in Lebanon and elsewhere to allow smaller organization, news organizations to put out information that was relevant to the local audience. WikiLeaks was also really important because it did something that... Um, researchers really like, which is to provide an archive of information, a way to, for us to look back at the actual data, not just what's allowed to be given to us. And to be able to compare that with, for example, information out of freedom of information requests, information that is declassified over time, and to allow us to know what's really going on with hindsight at, at some points. WikiLeaks's revelations changed the world when we got to understand what happened in the Iraq war, what happened in the Afghan war, the number of civilians who were, who were murdered, raped and tortured in these countries under the pretext of either liberating women or liberating the country. And it also allowed us to know things like the torture of 778 Muslim men at Guantanamo, 
um, who were held without charge or trial, abducted from different countries around the world. And these kinds of revelations brought WikiLeaks into a situation where um, the state really wanted to go after it. And in doing so, Julian Assange has suffered over a decade of some form of incarceration or the other. We're here today with Ugmundur Jonasson, who is the former Icelandic uh, interior minister who was involved in, in pushing back when the FBI were trying to stitch up Julian in Iceland. We're also joined in the studio by Craig Murray, former British ambassador, um, who, who blew the whistle on war crimes in Uzbekistan and has been a good friend of Julian throughout. Professor Ian Munro, who's an expert on whistleblowing and really understands things like the Chelsea Manning revelations and um, understands the context within which um, much of WikiLeaks's work was done. And last but not least, Stella Assange, Julian's wife and a fantastic lawyer in her own right. And we're very glad to have you here today. And I'm going to start really by um, asking if Stella, you could tell us a little bit about what Julian's situation is like at the moment. And we'll go back to talking about um, how Julian got here. But how is Julian? Where, what is the situation now? I know you have two young children. Um, how, do you get to see him? Uh, yeah, I have, I have two, um, now maybe three visits a week. So it's been increasing um, over the last few months. During COVID, it was terrible. I should say he's in Belmarsh prison, the harshest prison in the UK, and he's been there since the 11th of April, 2019. Um, so I'm able to see him fairly regularly at the, mo at the moment and with the kids. Um, but you can just imagine how difficult a situation it is uh, for, for him to fight this extradition from his cell and with all the constraints involved in navigating uh, prison bureaucracy and so on um, in order to just mount a defense in what is very a very complex uh, legal um, case uh, mm. in order to push back on, on the injustice the mm. US um, has, has subjected Julian to and is subjecting him to. Uh, but I see him with the kids about once a week, and mm -hmm. and they're young, your kids. They're yeah, they're three and five, and all their memories of Julian have been inside that prison. Um, so it's it's uh, you know it's it's difficult circumstances, but when we're together, it's joyful, and um, the kids love going to see their their father there. Um, even though they don't really understand what that place is. Yeah. And it, you talked about the prison bureaucracy and it, we were very aware of it during COVID, particularly when, for example, for a long period while it was below, while it was sub-zero, Julian wasn't getting any warm clothes. For a long period, uh, by that I mean several months actually, um, you were not even able to see Julian. Was that almost 18 months that you were not able to see Julian at all and no. his lawyers were not able to see him? It was, I think in total it was about eight months. Mm -hmm. um, there was just a, a total lockdown in Belmarsh. And for the six months preceding the extradition hearing, Julian did not see his lawyers in person. Uh, the first time he saw his lawyers was the day the, ex the three-week extradition hearing uh, resumed. So just imagine what kind of impact that has on, on being able to mount a defense. Uh, but the, the prison itself, the whole concept of imprisoning a person uh, who is, you know, there on remand, not serving a sentence, uh, 
pending potential extradition is uh, it's so cruel and dehumanizing because the prison system itself is dehumanizing um, to, to every prisoner in that prison, actually. Um, mm. but, but subjecting Julian, who is a publisher, to that kind of treatment, mistreatment and torture, it is literally torture uh, to subject a person who was just publishing true information, doing, you know, and, and winning many awards for it. Mm. And, you know, the Martha Gellhorn Prize and the, um, he's won the Amnesty International Prize for New sure. Media and the Economist Prize and so on. This is um, probably the journalist with the most journalism prizes in the world. Um, and he's in prison because of his work. And he's in, uh, in conditions of uh, extreme, extremely harsh uh, conditions. Because it, Belmarsh, of course, is one of the, is the prison where, the, the, it's a local prison, but it's also a prison where terrorist suspects are kept, people who are rapists, who are killers. And so it's not, it's, it's very harsh circumstances into, in which Julian is incarcerated. Mm. But you talked about um, this, the, the, the idea that it is literally torture, but that's what the UN has found. The UN rapporteur on torture, Professor Neil Smeltzer, along with an expert team of medical experts has found that Julian is being tortured and he has made very clear that both Britain and Sweden who have been involved in pushing Julian in this position and of course the United States have a, have a deep responsibility to the kind of situation that, the health situation that Julian now finds himself in. But while we're on the topic of prisons, I'd like to move to Craig Murray. Craig, welcome. Um, Craig, could you tell us a little bit about, um, y you were in Sockton prison mm. for four months, um, partly down to your, uh, many of us believe, to your reporting on the case of Julian. Could you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be in prison? Yeah, it is. Um, I think dehumanising is probably the best word for it, in that you, you are deprived of all human agency and of any choice in your life. Um, on the other hand, dehumanising uh, perhaps isn't the right word for it, because if anybody were to keep a dog in those conditions, you would be arrested for keeping a dog like that. Um, I, I, my, my personal experience was I think it's very similar in many ways to the conditions which Julian has been under. Is I was kept effectively in solitary confinement. I was locked in a cell for 22 and a half hours a day every day for four months. The, the longest I was ever out of the cell was one and a half hours a day, um, of which one hour was spent in a, a small exercise yard, um, uh, usually on my own, and usually with four guards watching me in case I somehow scaled the 20-foot <laughs> walls and, uh, and, 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 and escaped. Um, uh, I should say, the, um, uh, the, the prison guards, I, I keep getting told off for calling them guards and told I should call them officers or whatever, but they are guards, you know, let's call them what they are. The, the prison guards themselves um, found the situation as, as ludicrous as, as I did. I mean, they were doing it because they were told to do it, they, they, they didn't wish to. And we all became uh, very friendly uh, eventually. And, and one thing which um, I think... Uh, I understand Julian has also uh, benefited from, uh, is a great deal of sympathy from me, from both the staff and, the, and particularly the, the other prisoners, um, you know, none of whom thought I should be in jail and none of whom could work out why I would be in jail and all of whom were, were extremely nice and kind and, and supportive towards me. I didn't, I didn't feel, personally, I, I can honestly say I, I didn't feel fear at any time. I never felt under under threat of physical violence. Um, and I didn't personally experience aggression, other than on one, one single occasion uh, where I experienced, experienced aggression, a member of uh, prison staff. Um, but the, you know, being locked in a, in a tiny cell for 22 and a half hours a day is mentally quite hard to cope with over a period. And of course, Julian had it much harder than I did. And um, has it much harder than you? Has it much harder than I did? And, and in, there's a, 
there's something that makes Julian's incarceration much worse, which is I knew when I was getting out. You know, I, it, it seemed a long way away, but there was a date four months hence when I was leaving. Um, was Julian's incarceration is interminable. I, I mean, it's already gone on for, for three and a half years, and there is no knowing when it will end, even there's no knowing if it will end. Um, so um, uh, the psychological torture of, of that indefinite period of, of, of detention must be extremely hard. I, I can't imagine how I would have coped if I hadn't known you know, when I was to be released. Um, I, I, I think that must be terribly, terribly uh, uh, torturous. Yeah. One of the things that it, it would be interesting, you, you talked about these dehumanising conditions, but some of it is quite distressing to watch even as an observer. Mm. And I, we, many of us understood what was really happening in the courtroom through your accounts of mm. being the man in the public gallery. And I, as somebody who attended the courts every day as the legal observer uh, for the whole day in Society of Socialist Lawyers. I was interested in how dehumanizing the process to even enter the court was, both for Julian and for the rest of us, who were, firstly, many of us as observers, including you know, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, were excluded from the court, which was particularly disgusting given that there were over 90 seats in the public galleries across the two galleries and they would only allow two places every day in court and you had to queue up at 4 a.m. to be able to get in. But what was also annoying was the, the very strange things they did. For example, on the first day when I went in, I was told I could take in a pen and paper, but I was not allowed to write. Mm. And the, the room itself was incredibly cold where we were and... Julian, when he was taken into court, was uh, strip searched, you know, moved from cell to cell. He had his privileged papers taken off him. What did you, what are the main periods when we heard about what was really going on was during that court process? Are you able to summarize for those people who weren't there and haven't read your blogs, mm. what the process was like and what the key findings were at the Old Bailey, which was sometime uh, about eight, ten months, slightly longer than that, a year ago, over a year ago. I mean, the, the process is a raw demonstration of the power of the state and of the destruction of the victim of the state. Um, and the victim, in this case, Julian, was kept aside from the court. He was kept in a, in a glass cage. He was kept away from his lawyers. He couldn't communicate with his lawyers during a trial in order to instruct them. Uh, and you know, if, if you're having a trial, you need to be able to say to your lawyer, you need to be able to pass your lawyer information. For example, that witness has just said something which is not true. Can you counter it? He wasn't able to do that. He, he, the lawyers were sitting several rows of seats in front of him. Julian was in the cage and he had no method of communicating with them. And the uh, FBI were between him and yeah. the lawyers, yes. Uh, and. Um, uh, that really was quite um, uh, qu quite extraordinary. I remember when um, uh, his Spanish lawyer, Ito Martinez, when he was leaving, leaving, he was leaving the UK. In fact, he was going back to Spain, and he tried to say goodbye to Julian through in the dock as he as he left the courtroom, uh, and he was prevented from just saying goodbye. Uh, and Julian's day, of course, started terribly early in the morning when he'd be got out, strip searched, put in this van, which is like being put in a changing locker, in this, like in this little sectioned off area in a van, driven through London for hours, from Belmarsh to the, to the Old Bailey, in this freezing cold, sectioned off little, little steel cabinet, in effect. Um, and then would have to wait sometimes hours and hours till the proceedings started uh, and wasn't allowed direct access to that uh, to his lawyers even at that stage. In fact, I recall at one hearing, um, his lawyer, Gareth Pierce, uh, described to me that he'd been kept in, in a cell and they'd had to speak to him through a hatch 
in the ceiling of his cell. Well, it was the only way his, consult his lawyers had been able to consult with him. Uh, he wasn't allowed to, to keep his... He, he was given legal papers while he was in the dock, but he couldn't, he couldn't read the papers and listen to proceedings at the same time. He wasn't able to keep his papers to, to prepare for court the next day. So, so his, his ability... There was no real ability to instruct his lawyers, uh, which is a fundamental... <laughs> right of, uh, of somebody who's on, on trial. And often it was very plain, he couldn't really hear what was happening in the courtroom either when he was in his, his glass box. So that was the, the physically dehumanising aspect of it. You know, it really was quite... It, it, it was a charade of, of state power being used on an individual. It wasn't in any sense the fair trial or fair hearing or, uh, of an individual. Um, and then on top of that, you had this whole series of, of rulings from the bench on how the trial was, was conducted, which were, were truly remarkable and, uh, and which um, it was sometimes hard to believe this really was happening. You know, have, have they really made that, that ruling? I, won't, I could go on you know, for much longer than yes, we have on, on, on that subject, so I, I, I shan't go down there, but, but there, there were an extraordinary number of rulings on what was and what was not admissible and all of them always went against Julian. Uh, you know, it wasn't that there were a number of difficult rulings and, and some fell on this side and some fell on that side. No, they all fell absolutely uh, against uh, Julian, e even in the most extraordinary circumstances. Um, and there were some extraordinary people who testified in court for Julian, mm. ranging from Noam Chomsky through to people mm. like Patrick Eller, through to people like Maureen Baird, who's a prison warden in the US, through to Khaled El-Masri. Now, for those of you who don't know, Khaled El-Masri is uh, a German citizen who was abducted on the Macedonian border by eight CIA agents, um, put in a diaper, taken to a hotel, beaten up, and then rendited, where he was sodomized and tortured for months. After a few months of this torture, they realized that it was a case of mistaken identity. But in the arguments between the various arms of the national security intelligence, uh, and intelligence community in the US, they uh, decided that he must be a bad man anywhere and they were too busy arguing to let him go. So Mr. El Masri continued to be tortured. And finally, when he was released, which was on the Albanian border, he thought, he was, because he was released in the middle of the night, he thought he was going to be um, shot in the back of the head. The Albanian tricked him up, sent him back to Germany where nobody would believe his story because it was such a fantastical story of somebody saying, oh, I've been tortured and this man's gone missing. And then we know from WikiLeaks' revelations that the United States put a lot of pressure on the German, German government to deny Mr. El Masri justice, to not allow for those who abducted Mr. El Masri in this absolute travesty to be even taken to court. Finally, it was only through WikiLeaks' revelations at the European Court of Human Rights that Mr. El Masri um, received some amount of justice. So it's, it's people like these who spoke up for Julian in court, and it was really interesting to see Julian standing up for Mr. El Masri at one point, and I wondered if you could share a little bit about that. Well, that, that was a, um, a, a quite um, astonishing, it's one of the many rulings which was astonishing, which was that the judge ruled that Mr. al Masri would be allowed to give evidence, but would not allow, be allowed to say that the United States had tortured him. <laughs> um, even though the European Court of Human Rights, which obviously, which is the, the court superior to all UK courts, had ruled that the United States had tortured him. But, that, but the, the, the government of the United States, the, the lawyers representing the United States, objected to that being brought in and to evidence. And the, um, uh, and the judge ruled that he could not state in his evidence. He would give evidence as long as he didn't say he was tortured, um, which was astonishing. Uh, uh, at which stage, um, it was what Julian um, stood up in the dock and, and, and protested from the back of the, the hall. Um, 
and was, was slapped down by, by the judge who said he would be removed and the rest of the hearing would continue in his absence if, he, if there were any more outbursts. It, it, interestingly enough, it was almost the only time in the entire proceedings that Julian's voice was heard, because one of the strange things about these proceedings is he doesn't get to <laughs> say anything. Um, and, and he couldn't intervene through his lawyers because he had no means of contacting his lawyers because he was stuck in the, the, the glass box at the back of the hall. But that, that was very striking. But the, this crazy ruling that al Masri could give evidence but could not state um, that he had been tortured w was an example of, of, of the way the hearings were conducted. I'll just give one, one other example. I say I could give many. Of course. But the, um, uh, there was... Uh, the lawyers for the United States government were allowed several times, they repeatedly do it, did it, to quote um, uh, this uh, Luke Harding, uh, David Lee book written by the Guardian journalists in which they claimed that at a dinner uh, Julian had made some comment, and I think it was a comment about Afghan interpreters deserving what they got or, or something along those lines. Um, well, it was a damning quote. And I think on three different occasions, on at least three different occasions, for sure, um, the, uh, the, the lawyers representing the United States government were allowed to read out that passage from the book, uh, quite irrelevantly, to various witnesses and ask them what they thought about it. Um, and, and one witness, uh, Mr Gertz, had actually been at that dinner. He was one of four people at the dinner. He was the only person giving evidence who was an eyewitness to it. Um, and the defence were not allowed to ask him what had happened. Uh, the defence were not allowed to ask him if he wished to testify that that had not happened, that he had been there and it didn't happen. It was made up. It was an invention. But the, uh, the, the United States uh, lawyers were, were permitted three times at least to read out this allegation uh, just from a book. Um, uh, was the person actually there who was giving evidence was not permitted to say it did not happen. Mm. And, and, that, you know, there's, and that's not weird. I, I mean, it's weird, but it's not unusual. There, there were a lot of such rulings in, in the trial, in, in the hearing, and every single ruling of that kind went against Julian. It was the most extraordinary... It was farcical. Mm. You, you know, some of these rulings were absolutely farcical. And... and um, it was very hard to believe this really was happening before your eyes. Mm. And I think this entire idea that this is a legal process in itself is quite a farce because mm. charging Julian, who's a non-US citizen and a publisher, under 17 charges of the Espionage Act and one charge, which people assume is a hacking charge but isn't, which is called the Conspiracy to Commit Computer Intrusion Charge for actually obtaining information from a source... In, in the way in which the Extradition Act works, there is a presumption in favour of extradition or rather because of the treaty. And there is no... The United States doesn't need to prove beyond reasonable doubt, doesn't need to prove on the balance of probabilities that Julian has committed a crime. The expectation is Julian will be extradited. And all the discussion so far is, is Julian too ill to be extradited, does he meet one of the five bars or however many bars that can prevent him from being extradited, rather than this recognition that here is somebody who's not been convicted of any crime being taken abroad. On that note, I wondered if I might go to another part of that trial, which is a discussion about um, it, to Iceland, where we have Ögmundur Jonasson, uh, here. Thank you, Ögmundur, for joining us. Ögmundur is the former Minister of the Interior in Iceland, um, very experienced politician who's worked in Europe and elsewhere. And Ögmundur, could you tell us a little bit about one of the interesting elements of this case, which is about the FBI's key prosecution witness, which is uh, Sigurdur Ingi Thordarsson, who uh, has admitted in a published... Uh, testimony that he lied about Julian. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yes, I can. But first of all, let me say how important I think it is 
to have a conversation like this, just listening to you describing the treatment of Julian Assange, Stella's statements here, uh, your Stepa and uh, Greg Murray also, uh, talking about the brutality of state power, the exercise of state power. And sometimes one has been tempted to think, well, aren't they ashamed of this? Uh, why, why on earth do they yes. not try to hide this? But then we must remember that this is all for show. Because the question is not only breaking the whistle of Julian Assange, but silencing, silencing all whistleblowers. So it is all on show. It's all, uh, it's all for humiliating uh, people in court, in the courtroom, and, and around the, the courtroom. I think this is important to remember. But there is a limit. There is a limit because if public outrage becomes such that uh, that it is turned that 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 the tide is turned so to speak against the authorities then we have a completely different uh, situation and this can this can be done and i believe that this will happen in the course of the next uh, few weeks few months if they dare extradite julian assange to the united states then the the the, the world must rise up and before I come to the Icelandic uh, aspect of this, uh, let me say that we, of course, in Iceland, were, like the entire world, uh, watching uh, the footage, the television footage provided by WikiLeaks, or, or that we saw through WikiLeaks, uh, from Afghanistan, from Iraq. We were all uh, receiving uh, news about the, the TTIPs, the, the TISA negotiations, CETA. Uh, this was after Julian Assange uh, disappeared, but WikiLeaks was still in operation, of course. We learned through WikiLeaks how international corporate powers were getting control of uh, the world's natural resources. Mm. We saw how democratic power was being uh, handed over to corporate power. And this is all thanks to WikiLeaks. And when it comes to Iceland, uh, I could mention that uh, uh, there were revelations about uh, uh, illegal handlings of Icelandic banks uh, prior to the banking crisis in Iceland in 2008. And this information was later used in uh, legal proceedings against uh, bankers. Uh, so I'm just mentioning a few examples uh, where WikiLeaks and Julian Assange in particular were providing us, providing the world and providing Iceland with information that was of, uh, uh, what shall we say, democratic value. Now, this is the context when FBI, the Americans, bank on, knock on our door uh, in the summer of 2011. Mm. And uh, they come first under the pretext that they want to cooperate with us uh, on an imminent uh, attack on Icelandic institutions. Uh, the state in, uh, state institutions and the power industry and, and, and important institutions in Iceland, they had the information they told us that there was an imminent attack on the computer systems of these institutions. And we, of course, uh, uh, we, of course, accepted this. Uh, I, uh, uh, and uh, this was in uh, late June 2011. But then later in the summer, when they actually arrived, the, it became clear that something else was, was in their minds. Because they, what they wanted us to do was to cooperate in framing Julian Assange, in framing Julian Assange in a criminal case in the United States. So uh, 
<laughs> which was, of course, a completely different matter. And I was, as you said, I was the Minister of Interior at the time, so we included Minister of Justice, Minister of the Police, so uh, I was the one who was uh, uh, formally responsible. Uh, and I, of course, uh, uh, stopped these uh, proceedings immediately. The CIA, the Americans, they had no interest, of course, in Icelandic banks or, or banking scandals. But they could use Iceland in an international context because what they have been trying to do all along is to make states, even small states like ours, complicit so that they are able to say, you know, the, the international community is cooperating against this evil, this independent spy organization as, as uh, Pompeo, former yeah. CIA director and later uh, 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 secretary, uh, US secretary. In the, in the government, in Trump's uh, government, phrased it. He said WikiLeaks, as we all remember, is a, an independent spy organization and it must be a priority to take it down. And this is what they wanted us to cooperate with them in doing. But uh, we refused, I refused, and, uh, and uh, I think this was our duty, of course, and, and now we look to, to, to the entire world. The, the only people, the only force which can uh, stop uh, them extraditing Julian Assange is the public. And we must, we must awaken the, the, the public. And, yeah. and I, I really believe that this can be done in the coming weeks, coming months, because we should never forget that everybody has wanted the information provided by WikiLeaks. Nobody has ever been able to point out that there were fake news or wrong news provided by WikiLeaks. There were only news that, that international, well, the international corporate power or state power wanted to silence. Mm. Mm. Uh, on that note, Talking about whistleblowers and their importance, um, Ian, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing? Ian, of course, has been researching whistleblowers and uh, people like Robert Thibault, who defended Edward Snowden, people like Nancy Hollander, you've interviewed them, you've in interviewed a number of other people. Can you tell us a little bit about how these whistleblowers are treated when they blow the whistle? but also what, how important they are in the whole process. Oh, thanks, Deepa. Well, firstly, I want to uh, start by reiterating what everyone else has said. This is uh, what's happening to Julian Assange is a gross injustice, a terrible injustice, and uh, uh, a very, very serious threat to investigative journalism, to uh, w uh, the future of whistleblowing and, and so on. Um, to take the case of um, the Assange extradition specifically, uh, it, it's numerous uh, UN investi independent investigations have already determined that Julian Assange has been arbitrarily detained. Uh, Julian Assange is being tortured and Julian Assange is being uh, treated arbitrarily uh, through uh, indefinite legal prosecution and various other uh, Indeed, mechanisms. Where the process is punishment. Absolutely. The process is punishment. And uh, Neil Smelser, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, and the UN Arbit uh, Group on Arbitrary Detention, Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, and various uh, bodies have already determined these important findings. And now you have uh, Amnesty and so on um, also supporting uh, the Assange campaign, and everyone should be behind this. Uh, if you think uh, the extradition is specifically focused on the work that uh, Julian Assange did and WikiLeaks with uh, Chelsea Manning, and uh, that's it uh, in revealing uh, crimes against humanity and human rights violations in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they want to put Julian Assange in prison for revealing crimes against humanity and, and human rights violations. Chelsea Manning was put in prison, sentenced for 35 years. She only served seven. Two of those were 
uh, in solitary confinement. The then UN Special Rapporteur on Torture investigated the case and said she should be released immediately, uh, um, compensated, and uh, she is being tortured. And you can see a very similar dynamic now. What's bizarre is uh, Barack Obama uh, commuted, they didn't pardon, but commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence. 35 years. Julian Assange is being wanted for 175 years for essentially the same work. Investigative journalism revealing US crimes against humanity and human rights violations. 175 years. It's utterly bizarre what's happening. The fact that journalists in the mainstream, uh, on the left and the right of the political spectrum, are largely ignoring or not picking up on, on these issues is extremely disappointing and, and very, very worrying. And the difficulties that uh, the Assange uh, family and the uh, WikiLeaks campaigners have, have had in gaining traction in the mainstream media is also of great concern, not only for uh, the fate of Julian Assange, who, as you say, uh, many people said, the work is phenomenally important and a revolutionized, uh, revolutionized journalism, revolutionized whistleblower protection, helped raise public's consciousness of the important work of of whistleblowers and uh, revealed all sorts of stuff as um, many of you have, um, mm. uh, um, uh, Ogmunder and uh, uh, Craig have already uh, mentioned and uh, you know it's it's so it's such important work um, but yeah but it's such a, a strange case in, in that there's you know where do we go when when you've got this willful blindness this willful ignorance on behalf of much of the mainstream media not everybody but um, you know, mm -hmm. um, yes, and we've had a yeah. good few people like Peter Roborn and Jonathan Cook who have written about Julian, but it would be, and all the, all the newspapers, mainstream newspapers now have finally spoken up about Julian and written editorials, but they have been complicit in the 10 years of torture or more that he has suffered. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the people who defend um, whistleblowers? Yeah. And the research that you've recently undertaken on dissensus and um, what, that, what that's all about. Yeah, so one of the important things, whistleblowers essentially, uh, they function to, of course they raise important issues, public interest disclosures, where they release information into the uh, public domain about corruption. And that corruption could be relatively small scale, related to one particular organisation, or it could be endemic. And one of the important features of, of the WikiLeaks organization is that they released uh, not only small scale disclosures about small scale corruption, but uh, endemic corruption in the, finan in, in the financial industry, in the uh, I environmental crimes, uh, war crimes, military, uh, military intelligence organizations, um, uh, hacking and mass surveillance in the CIA Vault 7 leaks, all sorts, a whole range of human rights violations from small, relatively small crimes to, to large-scale crimes, and, and they, uh, ra uh, which weren't being given sufficient attention in the media or were being ignored by the media. Poss we, we, we don't know why, uh, possibly because people have, uh, you know, are, are scared. Possibly it hard, it's hard work. Uh, the, in the case of Chelsea Manning, uh, of course, uh, she approached the New York Times and the Washington Post with uh, information for and was rebuffed by both organisations. You know, like you've got the media aren't doing their job. Who's doing the job? Well, it's the whistleblowers and the and organisations like WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is, isn't the only organisation, of course, but it it's certainly the most influential, profoundly influential and revolutionary organisation, I think, in terms of the exercise of democratic oversight. Mm. And uh, it's this public interest kind of role of WikiLeaks, which is not about making money for themselves or acting on behalf of any particular state. It's this idea that ordinary people come together to, to understand what's really going on and help democracy to flourish. The other thing that what you said reminded me was this idea that... The, for those of you who haven't watched it, you must go to collateralmurder.wikileaks.org. It's very distressing, but it's something you must watch. The first video there is a short video from the streets of Baghdad where ordinary civilians were gunned down. And you see how the United States military treats it like some kind of video game where they're gunning down civilians and, oh, if they've brought their children along, it's their fault, etc. And some of you will have seen that, but I, for those of you who've already seen that, further down on that same page, there is a video of 
a United States soldier, Ethan McCord, talking about that incident. And that is one of the most powerful videos, I think, that has been made in many years to allow us to understand that what is happening on the ground when our young men and women go into these countries is destroying us as much as it is destroying the other country. And it's also very interesting to see how the state silences those who are um, willing to do the right thing when they're on the front line. Because I think a lot of people, um, maybe not within the left, but within the general mainstream of people whom we speak to, revere the army, revere the military, and see this as some kind of service, and therefore cannot get their heads around the fact that uh, what our men and women are doing in other countries is brutality and torture. There's, there's that barrier. There's also this belief that um, when we go into, whether it is uh, arming people to do Ukraine, etc., the, the war in the war in Ukraine, we are doing it because we have some good motives. And I'd like to come back to Craig on that, which is to ask you a little bit about um, what was happening in Uzbekistan and what the revelations that you came about and what it feels like as a whistleblower to provide these revelations. Because what, what happens if there is no Julian Assange and no WikiLeaks and no people that people like you can go to to, to tell the truth? Yeah, I, I was probably fairly typical um, of whistleblowers in some ways, in that my first instinct was to operate within the organisation where I worked. So um, when I discovered that we were complicit in, in torture and, and rendition, my, um, my first move was to send official telegrams back to the top of the Foreign Office addressed to Jack Straw, um, setting out our complicity in torture, uh, explaining the evidence for it and explaining why that was illegal and we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. And this uh, evidence in, involved a young man being boiled alive? Yeah, it, it included a, a evidence of a, a, a gentleman who was um, boiled alive and we had um, detailed photographs of the corpse that we sent back to the University of... Well, we sent back to the Foreign Office Human Rights Department, we sent them on to the University of Glasgow Pathology Department for analysis, and they came back saying he died of immersion in boiling liquid. And before that, he'd had his fingernails pulled out and he'd been beaten about the face and head. So, you know, the, the evidence of what was happening was very... And that was only one example of, of many, many. The evidence of what was happening was very stark, and, and the... Uh, and there was, the security services weren't denying we were getting intelligence from these uh, torture sessions. Um, uh, and my, my expectation was um, that... Well, I, I thought the security services must be out of control. You know, I thought, obviously, Jack Straw doesn't know this is happening, or Tony Blair doesn't know this is happening. Um, there were junior ministers in the Foreign Office who I knew. P Peter Hayden I'd known since I was a teenager um, and known him in, in anti-apartheid campaigning days and thought, for he's a decent man. He obviously doesn't know this is happening. All I have to do is get the information to the top of the organisation and it will be stopped. Um, but I was, of course, rapidly disillusioned. Uh, I, I was told that, basically, this is the policy. It has been approved from the top. Um, and, uh, and you're just a civil servant. Your job is to follow, follow the policy which ministers have set, which is that in the context of the war on terror, we need intelligence from torture. Um, and uh, it was at that stage I decided to, um, uh, to blow the whistle, uh, in effect. Um, which I didn't, in fact, do through, through WikiLeaks. Yes. Um, uh, and in fact, I, I tried to do it through WikiLeaks and uh, didn't get anywhere because they, they were rather distrustful of this ambassador coming out of the blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. As they should be. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of poor start to the relationship. Um, but the, uh, so my own whistleblowing went through the, um, uh, went, went through the mainstream media, um, through the Financial Times, in fact. Um, but I think the, uh, the ability of WikiLeaks to provide that kind of safe Dropbox anonymity option you know, is, is, is the same for people. But whistleblowing is very hard to do. I, I, mean, I was giving up. I'd, I'd given 22 years of my life to the Foreign Office. Um, I've been six years in its senior management structure. Um, and, uh, you know, when you have this 
these cases where your conscience doesn't allow you to continue doing and the organisation's not going to change and you've tried to change internally. It's a huge decision to, to take. Um, because you are within the system and somehow... Are... Yeah, you're, you're part of it and, and all your peer relationships are part of it. All your friends are, are, are a part of it. Um, it, 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 it. It's very difficult. And Wikileaks became, of course, central to a kind of community of whistleblowers. Um, so, uh, you know, people like Daniel Ellsberg and Ray McGovern, John Kiriakou and others, um, uh, we, um, we all support each other and, and Julian and Wikileaks was central to that, that support and Wikileaks links to organisations like the Courage Foundation, you know, the, this ongoing work of encouraging whistleblowing in the interests of humanity can, continues uh, 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 and I think is, is extremely important. I don't know if Stella would like to come in on, 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 on that. Please. Um, well, I think I was just thinking as, as you were speaking about how WikiLeaks, you know, it's important to understand that Julian's being punished for perhaps for the most important journalistic work there's been in the, in the last century. In history, yeah. basically, uh, because of the revolutionary um, aspect of WikiLeaks and also how it is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, this is a, an archive um, that is being mined by historians, by researchers, by academics, um, by journalists, and will continue to do so um, for decades to come. Um, so Julian's being punished for um, journalism as at its strongest um, and for delivering that to, mm -hmm. to the public. But that's, in a way, that's kind of looking back. Mm. But I also think it's, it's really important to understand how um, the case itself in terms of the present and what it means into the future is equally important because it's, it's not just about understanding the human rights abuses that were exposed and the injustice of that, but how this very process, the, the way, in order to treat Julian the way he is being mistreated, um, the system itself is creating a new norm. It is corrupting itself and it is um, shifting um, its nature mm. um, into something, into a, a new uh, social reality in which, uh, you know, um, publishing the truth is a crime, in which uh, journalists can be persecuted uh, mm. in and journalism can be called espionage. And journalism can be called, traduced into, into espionage. It's not espionage, it's, no one claims Julian is a spy for a, a foreign nation. They are saying that um, if you publish true information that the state um, doesn't tolerate, they can put you in prison as if, uh, as if you had been a spy. If you give the public true information about state crimes, we'll, we can put you in prison. And that is the, that is the bare bones of it. And that is, the, that is the, um, the new, that's, that's what they're trying to achieve is the new norm um, and, the, and, and what so far the UK courts have allowed to proceed. And um, Priti Patel in June uh, approved the decision to extradite uh, Julian. And one aspect that we haven't even talked about is the fact that the United States had plotted to assassinate Julian while he was in the embassy. And this is not some wild conspiracy theory. This is uh, the uh, evidence uh, of this was a publication uh, an investigation by three national security journalists in Washington, D.C., very establishment types who um, have no uh, 
um, you know, adherence or admiration necessarily for, for Julian or WikiLeaks, um, but we're coming at it because they had over 30 sources in the CIA, in the National Security Council, who themselves became sort of whistleblowers because they disagreed with the policy of going as far as plotting to assassinate Julian in the UK um, while he was in the embassy. Um, there were discussions about poisoning him, about um, kidnapping him in a deniable way, way while, while he was in the embassy, um, and renditioning him, taking him to a black site. I mean, we're talking uh, the methods of the uh, so-called war on terror and mm -hmm. importing them into, um, into the UK and applying them to journalism. This is, we're talking, um, you know, these are uh, quantum leaps into a completely new uh, uh, lawless framework. And so the, the, basically the lawlessness that has been um, developing since the beginning of 9-11 of mm -hmm. um, that was, was being uh, applied in other countries, states of exception where you could torture, states of exception where you could kill, um, where due process was no longer uh, a requirement and, and all these legal fictions that were created in the context of the war on terror. Now that is being imported um, through, through various means, but uh, encapsulated uh, most clearly in the case of Julian. And the consequences for this are enormous because uh, the reason Obama decided not to prosecute Julian, well, there, there were several, and the Department of Justice spokesperson at the time said himself, um, we, we will not prosecute uh, Julian Assange over the Manning leaks because if we were to do so, we would set a precedent for the rest of the press. He said, Julian Assange is not a hacker, he's a publisher. Mm. And we are not prepared to criminalize journalism. Yes. And so the new reality is that journalism is a crime. Nothing changed, just that the policy, the policy changed under Trump. And this prosecution is a Trump era um, uh, prosecution. Julian was indicted during the Trump years while Pompeo was plotting to assassinate him. And the UK uh, has gone along with it. It has gone along uh, with imprisoning Julian year after year and becoming complicit uh, in, in Julian's torture. Mm. Talking about this complicity, I, does it surprise you as a lawyer that the courts are unmoved by the p fact that Julian's privileged legal conversations have been spied upon, that he cannot obviously either get due process in the US or in the UK? Could you tell us a little bit more about the spying? And I'll come back to Craig about that because he was spied upon as well. Well, um, it's very interesting because what we now know the CIA was plotting um, we knew another aspect was the actual implementation of what the CIA was instructing. Um, inside the embassy, there was a, a security firm, um, a private security firm headquartered in Spain, and they were receiving instructions from the CIA. This has come out since um, to spy on Julian's conversations with his lawyers. Um, and this wasn't just incidental. They had a camera inside the embassy and all this. No, they were, they were recording audio from these conversations and then physically transporting the hard drives to the United States every two weeks. So it was, you know, it was a, a sophisticated and um, uh, operation. And we know this because of whistleblowers, because um, when Julian was arrested, uh, two or three people within that security firm then went to the press and subsequently um, have um, testified uh, before the investigating magistrate uh, about their role in carrying out these orders that were coming from the CIA spying on Julian's lawyers. Of course, there is no um, 
chance of a of of being able to have a fair trial in the context of your um, privileged privileged legal conversation having been spied on by the by the other side, mm -hmm. um, and the 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 you uh, sorry the Spanish courts are the Spanish um, authorities are taking this case very seriously. They raided um, the security company. Uh, they uh, they have. Um, tons of evidence mm -hmm. of the of these recordings, um, and they've asked the U.S. Um, to provide information about some of the things that they've they've um, discovered, and they've also asked the U.K. Um, um, are they being cooperative? Uh, the U.S. is is uh, being completely uncooperative. Uh, the U.K. Mm -hmm. initially was cooperative, allowed Julian to testify, mm -hmm. um, but when the Spanish courts asked Julian's lawyers, who were the victims of the of the espionage by the U, by the U.S. Um, via the Spanish company, um, they have just not responded to this uh, request by Spanish authorities. And this is extremely unusual. I mean, it's probably unprecedented that um, two friendly nations, um, where there are uh, established um, um, cooperation um, frameworks, and this happens constantly that they're exchanging mm. information, um, is is uh, not responsive, especially on something like spying on UK lawyers. Uh, why would why would uh, this, the UK authorities um, not be responsive on that? So, uh, you know, as Craig was saying, it's it's completely. Uh, incomprehensible really that that mm -hmm. Julian is even that this case wasn't thrown out on any one of these elements that we're talking about uh, yet here we are and so um, it, it is shocking that um, the case hasn't been thrown out um, on on this basis alone sure and as we're hurtling towards the next stages of this case now that Priti Patel has sanctioned the extradition and there's a couple of appeals pending, and then it seems like a way, a channel is being made to send Julian off to the United States. There are two things I would really like to ask you, which I think are the people viewing this would like to know about, which is what can they do and what are the next steps? Because, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy when you see 10 years worth of this to think, God, this looks too complicated, what, what can I do to help? You know, I'm not an expert in the law. So can you so, tell us a little bit about what people can do? Yeah, I mean, firstly, I would caution against trying to understand the, every little detail uh, about the, the, the legal case. The, the simple um, answer is, is this is a political case. Mm. And you just, you know, everyone, any um, observer can see that this is a political case that Julian is being crucified, publicly crucified, um, because he embarrassed um, the, the most powerful country in the world, and the UK is playing along. Uh, as Ugmunder was saying, the most important thing is uh, to mobilize, as in to not just sit there and say, oh, well, this is unjust, but to do something about it. And on the 8th of October, we are going to do something about it. We're going to form a human chain around Parliament. And I was surprised to discover that this has never been done before in the UK. There has never been a human chain around Parliament. Um, 3,500 people have already signed up to do so, um, uh, to you know, show up on the day at 1 o'clock. It's a Saturday. And, and um, join hands in support of Julian's release. And it's really important for the authorities to see that uh, this is completely intolerable and people are disgusted by what the government is doing, by what the courts are doing. Um, the, um, in order to learn more about the case, people can buy Neil Smeltzer's book, yes. um, which is the trial of Julian Assange. Neil Smeltzer, he was the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture and has completely yep. deconstructed the persecution against Julian um, in, you know, in, in forensic detail. And, uh, you know, books are being written, films are being made right now. This is the, um, 
you know, the, the direction Julian's case is the defining case of our times because yes. of the uh, because of what is being done to him, because of the importance of what WikiLeaks um, has done, because it has embodied uh, journalism at its finest and and human rights and accountability, and that is what is being punished. Um, so, uh, and to uh, Go to donextraditeassange.com and sign up and, and stay up to date with what's happening. Can I just remind everyone that the 8th of October is also the day of the RMT strike. So if you're traveling from Liverpool, it might be worth traveling a day in advance and, uh, or making other arrangements to be able to get to Parliament. It's, it's really important that you're there because, of course, people it'll be difficult for people to get there on the day. It's, I also wanted to remind everyone of the of the source of Niels Meltzer's book, which is one of the areas which we haven't talked about and which the left is, of course, very concerned with in relation to Sweden. And one of the, I, I think the, one of the best dis, descriptions of that and the detail of that is in Niels Meltzer's book. Um, it's also something that Lisa Longstaff at Women Against Rape has written about extensively, and you can find her articles. But the book is on Verso, books and right now I believe it's at a 40% discount so I would encourage you to uh, get a copy. I also wanted to highlight to everyone how important it is that if you can stick a sticker in your window, if you can write to your local parliamentarian saying you are watching, that will make a difference. If you can come together with the local group in Liverpool, there is now a a group in Liverpool which is set up to free Julian Assange, please do that. If you're a member of the Merseyside Pensioners Association, and I know that's a fantastic activist group here in Liverpool, please get your group to host an event about Julian Assange and get Stella to talk about it, or myself, or Craig, or Ian, and we will talk to your members about what is happening. Talk to your trade union branch. It is really important that this is discussed outside of just activist circles. So if you have friends who are lawyers or judges or otherwise, ask them why the UK is not concerned at this complete and utter uh, destruction of the rule of law. And it is important that we, we encourage people to pay attention to it because there are so many things going on, especially the cost of living crisis, people's own personal problems. And it's easy to think, oh, this is too complicated, or this is not that important, and I'll put it to one side, and I'll come back to it. But Julian's life is at stake, and it, it, there is not much more room for us to go before Julian could be extradited. And so it is really important that you participate. And as I come to that point, I know we have only a few minutes left in this conversation. We could go on for forever. I'd like to bring back the four speakers and invite them to, if they have... If there were things they wanted to say, which I always find I remember after the meeting's over, but if there are things they wanted to say or any final thoughts, I'd like, if, is Erkmundur still um, able to be brought yes. in? Fantastic. Um, if you could, um, a few final words, please, Erkmundur. Um, well, I, I found this uh, conversation very interesting and illuminating. I found it chilling to listen to Craig's description of what happened in in uh, Uzbekistan, and uh, but still more chilling to hear of the inaction of the system, of the British system, and thus the complicity in what was happening in Uzbekistan. Now, when I meet people and talk about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, I never meet anybody who justifies what is being done to him, or defends it. Everybody thinks it is wrong. But most people also remain silent. That is the problem. But I think the world is just on the verge here. The silent world can so easily become vocal because everybody recognizes where justice lies. Everybody recognizes this. So I agree with what you are saying. Depa is saying 
let us let us join in in, in the human chain uh, chain around Parliament on October the eighth. You say it is. Yes. Uh, she is urging us to put stickers in the window. You know, if everybody rises up or speaks up, you know this 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 will happen, and the world which is silent wakes up. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, um, I. I like to certainly add to urging people to get in there on the 8th of October and showing uh, the strength of support for, for Julian um, publicly. Putting your hands around Parliament is quite difficult, of course, because one edge of Parliament runs along the River Thames. So we have to actually go over the bridge and along the South Bank and then over another bridge in the way back. So the total circle is actually several miles. And having announced we're going to do it, we have to do it, failing to do it, will, will, will be mocked by the, uh, by the media. So we absolutely need people to come. If you need an incentive to come, come. If you need another incentive to come, let me tell you that after it's over, I will be in the Westminster Arms and will accept drinks from anybody who wants <laughs> uh, to buy one for me and, and we can have a chat. But please do get there on the 8th of October. That, that's very very, very um, important. Get together with people and hire coaches uh, because uh, the railways uh, are going to be on strike. Um, I think uh, everything we've heard is absolutely correct about the importance of WikiLeaks, the, the importance of Julian, the importance of new media and what this means for the world going forward and the ability of those in power to crush anybody who dissents or reveals any secrets. That's all very true. Um, but also there's a human being at the centre of this, a human being uh, who is being tortured. And um, I know that most of you, uh, if you were within walking distance as, as a human being was in torture, would walk and intervene. You would try and stop it. You wouldn't put up with anybody being treated uh, in, the, in that way in, in, in your immediate vicinity. Um, Julian may not be in your immediate vicinity, but he has been subject to this for years and years and years. And in standing up for him, you're standing up for all victims of torture, for all victims of, of state persecution. So please, let's show uh, we, we really mean it. Be active long term, form local groups, join uh, local groups, go to the website of Don't Extradite Assange and see other things you can do. But please, please do get there on the 8th of October. Thanks, Craig. Ian? Uh, yeah, uh, I would certainly second uh, those two uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, I, but whistleblowers, human union activists, human rights activists, Social movement activists, they change the world, they've changed the world for the better um, many, many times over. And now is the time to, to do it again for Julian Assange and um, stop this gross injustice. Thanks, Ian. And Stella, I'd like to come back to you for some final thoughts and wanted to wonder if you could say something also about the fa fact that um, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in Mexico has handed over the keys and his colleagues have handed over the keys of Mexico City to Julian. There are lots of politicians around the world who are paying attention to this case now. It's no longer something hidden in silence, although Julian himself is being disappeared. What final message do you have for the people watching? And um, can you tell us about what, what Julian might want us to do and what he is looking forward to and what we can do to support him as an individual, you as a family, and the campaign? Well, um, the Mexican president on the day of uh, the celebration of independence on, on stage brought Julian's case up and said this is the most important case. Everyone everywhere needs to come on board on, on, on free, free, to free him. Um, Julian's historical significance is, is un, you know, undebatable. He's, he's a, a huge, uh, his, uh, his importance as a human rights defender is undisputed. And, but Julian is also a, a very, he's a, um, a 
a very thoughtful person and he uh you know his his commentary about the world is sorely needed as well um you know he he's that's partly why he's been silenced um and he, you know he's a good man uh who has been slandered and and smeared in such uh such a terrible way um but i i'd urge everyone to see julian speak um to get to know julian because not what the you know the media that was slandering him was saying because i think that that is um present in some sense when there's some hesitation but actually to go to youtube and and watch some videos of julian speaking because then you can get to know julian um and he's such a wonderful person i mean he's an extraordinary person and he is you know he would stand up for everyone he has stood up for everyone he yeah. stood up for all of us when he's he has what... already but you know he would do it for you um so please do it for him as well thank you on that note we end this um somewhat depressing but somewhat inspiring discussion about the world's most important political prisoner and now the the baton is passed on to you who is who are watching are you going to sit and watch while this injustice continues or are you going to do something to change the world and i really hope that you will join all of us in saying that this is unacceptable that we care about whistleblowers that we care about knowing the truth about those people who do not know what's really going on and are affected by those circumstances and we need publishers like Julian who allowed us to um to really engage with the truth ourselves and make up our own minds which i know many of you really are quite you know you're critical of the state you understand what's going on and you want to find the right information and on this note i'd i'd like to remind you that when you watch that collateral murder video i told you about earlier remember that a washington post journalist a pulitzer prize winning journalist was embedded in the very battalion that was gunning down those civilians and spent quite a lot of time in his book saying that oh this was fine this was within the rules of engagement and this was absolutely okay and there was nothing wrong with what they did and then we saw the collateral murder video and then we knew what really happened and that's why it's really important that we stand up for julian and we stand up for ourselves thank you so much and thank you to the organizers of this wonderful um event and series of events rather discussions and all those people who are campaigning in their communities julian's fight is your struggle because if you're campaigning to make your community safer if you're campaigning to save the nhs if you're campaigning to against you know false allegations if you're campaigning against um criminality of the state if you're campaigning to support a loved one in prison or in the health service these are you need the information that these whistleblowers give and it's through this information that you and i will help liberate the world thanks